If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Simon O'Connor lost his seat at the election, so hopefully he'll be free to speak his mind. As I said before, I'm planning on challenging him about the way MPs refuse to speak to the protesters at Wellington, amongst other things. And uh, we're going to talk about free speech and a few other topics. Simon's on the line now, so let's get chatting. Welcome to The Crunch. Cam, it's lovely to join you. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, look, I've been reading a few of your uh, posts on your Substack on point, and I've been sitting there nodding sagely, thinking, you know, have we lost something from our parliament by uh, Simon not being uh, in parliament anymore? And and I have to say, I think we have lost something from parliament for you not being there, and um, because your writing is is really really good, and uh, and it's on point. You know, just to, to to take your headline. Do you feel a lot freer now that you're no longer in parliament? Do you feel a, 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 like a weight has come off your shoulders? Look, I, I do. Um, I mean, you miss elements of Parliament to start on that side. I certainly miss engaging with my colleagues, particularly my year group. You know, I miss helping constituents. But on the other side, life is so much freer when you don't have to be worried every day about what the next uh, role, job, scandal is. But also, paradoxically, uh, you are freer to speak and think in a way outside of Parliament, which in many ways, Cam, is quite sad. Parliament's meant to be the place where people are the most free, protected, if you will, to to speak, Mm. and yet, ironically, uh, not. And we can get into that a bit more, if you like, as well. So, no, I'm I'm enjoying writing again. I've been taking a bit of a a break somewhat, but it's nice to be writing and and thinking about things again. Well, maybe you'll... um... Yeah, you know, I see you've got a couple of podcasts up. Maybe you you want to start talking to Reality Check Radio and become a host. Look, you never know. I've never been shy of an opinion. It wouldn't matter if you're talking to my parents, my wife, my friends, or my now former political colleagues. Yeah, I was never never shy of an opinion on things. Well, that, well, that's the thing, isn't it? Is I think that politics, particularly over the last let's say ten years, maybe let's go back to the Clark years. I think that. Politics became highly polarised in New Zealand, particularly with Helen Clark, and then uh, when we changed to the John Key government, um, and then back again, of course, to the Ardern regime. I believe New Zealand politics is is poorer for that that period of time where there was increased polarisation, where there wasn't a contest of ideas, uh, which of course is fostered by free speech. You know, if you had the wrong think. You were shouted down. You know, we, we even saw, uh, you know, ostensibly someone who claims to be a journalist trying to silence voices on the other side. You know, with the dirty politics um, scandal. And let's make put no bones about it. That's what it was about. It was about being polarized and about silencing voices that were effective against the the government that you know the opposition parties as they were back then. Yeah, look, sadly, I think we are seeing a more polarised New Zealand. That's been evident, certainly in recent years. But I think you're right to say it's been going for for quite a while. And the thing about polarising, it's a bit like a metronome or a a pendulum, if you will, that that, it swings one way, then it swings a bit harder the other, and it gets worse and and worse. Um, Look, I would argue and and have suggested, even when I've given lectures at universities over the years, um, MMP actually has a lot to do with with this. Mm. I, I think you can look back to... The, the mid-90s, where all of a sudden, instead of having, if you will, 100, 120 MPs, if you will, with their own power base of an electorate, yeah. it was replaced by an MP, which puts the party first. Mm. And then who's first in the party? It's the leader of the day. Uh, and what they want, she or he, becomes very dominant. And so everyone sort of has to kick in behind that that narrative. So you don't, I think, see as much discussion and debate uh, in the public realm and I'm sad to say I don't think you see as much – well, I can speak to it because I was there. You don't have as much discussion and debate even within the parliament or caucuses itself. Again, imagine – and I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to articulate this as well as I should, but 
the, the pyramid of influence has become very steep. So instead of being very broad, lots of MPs and theorists discussing things, it's become very, very narrow, that triangle, and it's led by the top. What the party leader wants is generally where the party is going. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's an inside joke uh, in Parliament uh, or in the Beltway uh, of Wellington that there's a cabinet, but there's actually a kitchen cabinet, which is three or four or maybe five people at the most that are the real power brokers, uh, and they're, they're literally creatures of the leader or the party. And we've seen this uh, both with Helen Clark, uh, with the John Key uh and English government, and we saw, of course, that with the Ardern Hipkins government. And I'm not sure we're seeing it just quite yet with the uh, government of Luxon because there's three parties in there that are, have got some very mercurial and strong-willed people uh, that won't take uh, well to direction that we all need to, um, you know, party vote national or uh, wear a blue suit or, or all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I think again, it, it's for me not particularly partisan in so far as it, it's it's manifested itself as this centralising of influence or power mm. in the MMP environment is not unique to the left or the right. I, I think you're correct that the current coalition deal, sort of this three headed um, dynamic, will will create tensions. But you know, for the sake of argument, camp, that's still going to be three leaders who um, have strong controls of their their party. Yeah. Um, but I probably would just want to stress to listeners, it's not that New Zealand is only run by one, two or three people, but that the influence of individual MPs, uh, ministers, even ministries, heads of ministries is, I think, being constrained within the MMP environment. I know I keep coming back to it, but whoever the leaders are at the time hold enormous sway. Mm. And unity is such a key element. Uh, you know, media will exploit any disunity in yeah. a political party. And so it's a very brave, perhaps stupid member of parliament who, who steps away from that. So unity keeps a lot of people quiet, if you will. Um, but I should also add, you know, there still can be robust discussions in, in caucus and so forth. But again, uh, it is a narrow group of people, the senior people who often set the direction of things. Yeah, I've seen it happen uh, inside the National Party. Yeah, um, you know, obviously with my family connections and things that I see these things up close and personal, and I, I've never been comfortable with this cult of personality um, that started really with um, Helen Clark. Uh, you know, when when they contrived uh, to always state that Helen Clark was the first elected prime minister, because of course Jenny Shipley was the first woman prime minister. Helen Clark was bent out of shape with that, and and. And when she eventually ended up prime minister, went about making sure that there was even plaques being erected. This is opened by Helen Clark, the first woman elected prime minister, which, of course, is a, a fantasy. We don't elect our prime ministers. They're chosen by the caucus to be the leader. Um, but that was the start of that cult of personality where, you know, you saw uh, Helen Clark on every billboard, even though it was heavily photoshopped or whatever. Uh, we saw with John Key with National Party sycophants running around with blue T-shirts on saying, I'm a key person. Um, we saw that with Jacinda Ardern especially, uh, not so much with Christopher Hipkins, uh, and we're seeing it again with Christopher Luxon, but at a different sort of a level um, because Luxon isn't a John Key. Um, you know, John Banks I was talking to earlier and he said the same thing, Christopher Luxon needs to be Christopher Luxon, not try and be John Key. But this cult of personality kind of adds to that polarisation where the leader says uh, what goes. And if someone like you who has very strong moral views, particularly on things like abortion, you get slapped around and told, uh, you know, I've had a word with with Mr O'Connor and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, modified his stance or whatever. Now, I know you pretty well um, from afar, but I know your upbringing – and I know you haven't modified your stance at all <laughs> on, on no. some of those moral issues. No, that's true. I mean, look, I, I've been very outspoken on life issues, issues to do with uh, China, amongst other things. And, yeah, I hold my views carefully uh, and well considered. I would add, always interested actually in a debate and a discussion with people. You know, everything yeah. can, can change. But, 
you know, I remember during particularly the, the, the Roe versus Wade situation, a journalist sort of um, questioned me about it. And I sort of stressed to them, I said, look, I didn't wake up this morning having never thought about these things. You know, mm. <laughs> quite a deep, uh, in my own perception, Cam, quite a deep thinker. Again, it doesn't mean I'm right, uh, but I don't tend to come to an opinion. But you're willing uh, to listen lightly. as well. You're willing oh, to I listen and have a debate, yeah. you know. Oh, I, I love it. And look, it's one of the, again, it's one of the sad, I, look, I didn't go into Parliament naively by any means, you know, had yeah. been around the party and, and so forth. But Especially you know, in Tamaki electorate. I mean, they're the most political of animals, you know. <laughs> oh, I never went to bed wondering what my electorate uh, thought on issues, and that was great. Uh, it yeah. sometimes drove me and my wife a, a little mad insofar as you'd be trying to go out for a walk um, and people would be stopping us left, right, mm. and centre to, to chat. And at one level, it's great. Um, occasionally, it would have been nice just to have spent, you know, 10 minutes with Rachel. But um, but it's, I don't know, I sort of hoped that Parliament would have had more time to, to think and consider things. Mm. And, and please don't get the idea that we're sitting on leather couches, smoking pipes, drinking whiskey, oh, no, pondering the world's of ponderables. That. They got they rid did. of the smoke filled. They got rid of the smoke filled rooms. I think that's a tragedy and needs to be brought oh. back. Personally, that's being right. a cigar smoker <laughs> myself. Well, I've always joked better to smoke in this world than the next, but um, <laughs> that's not that's not an encouragement to start smoking. But no, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is we didn't have as much time in Parliament as I'd hoped to sit back and consider things. As I say, you don't want to have the uh, big reading rooms where you spend hours pondering, but at the same time, so much is a rush, so little is done on the fly. And you'll know it yourself, having been uh, a deep follower of politics, so much policy happens in reaction to something else at the time. Mm. Uh, it's just pushed and rushed through. So I, I have been disappointed that we don't discuss things more. I am concerned, be it through media um, or leadership that ideas are often quickly crushed because they don't suit the narrative or you're the wrong person. It's, you know, it's the view not to be aired. So the ideas aren't teased out. And so the final point I'd make is it's no surprise we're constantly or the parliament's constantly having to make amendments and changes uh, mm. because they're making mistakes and they're not anticipating the problems down the line because, again, it hasn't been well thought out. Yeah. I mean, take the, take your tweet about Roe versus Wade, it was fairly innocuous, really. Um, and and, and I, the argument was had by the media largely because for New Zealanders, it's an academic argument. Uh, you mm. know, we have probably pretty liberal uh, abortion uh, laws in New Zealand. They're in no danger of being replaced uh, anytime soon or even remotely changed. And what happens in the United States where is a highly technical argument over whether the federal government has autonomy over the states. And let's face it, that was what the argument of Roe versus Wade was about. It wasn't about uh, that argument in the Supreme Court wasn't about abortion. It was about whether the federal government has the right to tell states how they can operate their own country, which people seem to forget that the United States is a collection of countries. Um, that's why it's called the United States. But that argument was missed in the gay abandoned, for want of a better term, of the media wanting to get a conservative MP for daring to have an opinion that was different to their liberal worldview. Yeah, well, that seemed to be the, the driving part. It was that you were not allowed to have any opinion other than one, which was to be completely, in this case, uh, pro-abortion mm. uh, and to support New Zealand's rather extreme abortion laws. So your first point's correct. This was an American uh, situation. Your second point's incredibly important for listeners to understand. The whole thing of Roe versus Wade, regardless of one's view on abortion itself, was really about states' rights. And at the end of the day, it's the United States of America, and each state wants to run its own health system, education system in its own way, not being directed by federal government. And that's been one of the key, key drivers but look, the way that was being handled certainly was that two or three years ago. Um, yeah, a couple of like, couple of three years. Yeah, probably yeah, two all, or three years ago. Yeah, all it was, all that media in particular and others were trying to do is say there is to be no discussion, there is to mm. be no debate on these topics. And New Zealanders should actually be quite concerned again, regardless of their ethical views. We have a number of topics now. It doesn't matter if it's life issues, gender issues, to do with the Treaty of Waitangi, for example. These are verboten. 
you're not meant to climate discuss change. them. Climate, climate change. Climate change, yeah, sorry, around COVID, of course. Um, there's mass, only mass one. Em, you, mass immigration is another one. You, you dare not say uh, we're full. Um, let's put a sign up and tell everyone we're full. You're not allowed to do that. We've got to welcome all comers, even if they're rat bags. Yeah, um, well, you've got a, the whole notion of multiculturalism as a, you know, I, mean, I study this at university. It's one of mm. my one of the degrees behind me. <laughs> um, th- these are fascinating topics, but they're fraught. But unfortunately, in modern New Zealand, the more fraught the topic, the less you're allowed to talk about it, or supposedly to talk about it. And two things I might happen, Cam, either you get attacked for having a counter opinion, uh, and what we just talked around Roe versus Wade is a good example of that, but I can think of other colleagues uh, who spoke up to do with uh, the treaty, climate change, and so forth, who were also forced to apologise. The second, and I think really important, if I might, um, is, is effectively people get censored. Yes. You just don't get published. You you don't. So you you mentioned my Substack. One of the reasons I'm writing there is that it's very infrequent that people like myself get published in mainstream media. We submit articles. They just don't get published. And you'll know of a lot of people in that space. They just don't get heard. So really to stress again to people, there are a lot of good people out there thinking, writing, speaking. It just doesn't often break into mainstream media because the editors won't allow it. Well, I mean, you know, one of the uh, one of your Substack posts is on exactly what we've just been talking about. This, uh, it's really a government and and governmental organisation and large corporates that are pushing this diversity, equity, and inclusion oh. type thing, which is it would you know it's actually an oxymoron because their roles are about creating division and about creating inequity and about excluding people because while they're inclu- being inclusive of, I don't know, Maori or trans people or whatever, then they're not actually looking for the best person for a job. They're looking for someone who fits a, 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 you know, ticks boxes. And, mm-hmm. and so you might be missing out on the best person for a job because you want them to be diverse and equal and, and inclusive and in actual fact you're being the opposite. Um, but there's this this insane amount of money that's being spent on doing all of this stuff, uh, and in New Zealand, it, it's it's getting worse. I mean, we, we're behind the rest of the world in this, but we can look, look at the UK and the United States and see where it ends up, and it doesn't end up anywhere nice. No, no, it doesn't, because actually, a lot of this um, identity politics, progressivism, wokeism, whatever you want to term it, is actually built on division. You've nailed it right at the start. Uh, and, and division doesn't lead to people coming together harmoniously. It leads to more division, which is why you've got this constant fight in the intersectionality area. Who is the greater victim? Uh, and it just spirals. And actually, ultimately, without being too heavy, it ends violently. Uh, and you saw hints of that last year uh, with the, the protests at Albert Park, uh, for example, the attempts so far to cancel uh, different events. Um, yeah. It actually gets violent, be it in word or physically. So we're on a bad trajectory. But yeah, like that latest Substack, I was frustrated uh, or more frustrated that, yeah, how much money has been spent on either divisive uh, entities such as the Christchurch call, because at its heart it is about dividing people, believe it yeah. or not. Well, um, and then, an in- yes. We'll, we'll come back to the Christchurch call because there's an interesting thing that I'll, I'll tell you about that you probably don't know, but. But carry on. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's good. I'm happy to come back to it. But yeah, all these uh, DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion roles. Um, put it this way even if you want to take the politics out of it or your viewpoints on it, at the end of the day, would you prefer we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on some Mandarin talking to us about what diversity looks like or higher paid police officers or nurses or people who are running our trade policy? Um, I know that I prefer the latter, and we know the government's cutting back the civil service. Um, I suppose part of my argument is I bet you a lot of these DEI roles won't go. It'll be the hard workers on the front line that will, and I think that's very sad. Well, the funny thing is I've heard a bit of a rumour from the inside that actually DEI people in those types of roles are uh, in the firing line of the government. Um, This is good if that's the case. Uh, but, but whether I would or not the it's... civil service listens to the ministers, you know, it's another matter. But, um, yeah, it is good. But just touching on that Christchurch call, now I, I happen to know that one country applied to join the Christchurch call, and if you have a look at the list 
of countries. There's quite a few, you know, United States and Canada and Great Britain and France, obviously, and New Zealand. But one country uh, applied uh, to join the Christchurch call, and the people of that country, and indeed their diaspora across the, the world, are among the most victimised people uh, on the planet, and they were quietly told to go away. And that Israel. country was Israel. And yep. I, I, I know that's true. Uh, I know people that were involved in the application uh, and couldn't, they were gobsmacked, but but being Israelis, they, they just sort of shrugged and went, oh, well, if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. Uh, I'd oh, I can completely, yeah, I, I can completely confirm it because um, it was something I raised, oh, it came across my desk a couple of years ago as, as an issue, and I remember uh, raising it into the likes of MFAT um, mm. and DPMC to say, well, you know, was there an application? Uh, why was it turned down? Um, so you're absolutely correct. But I think it is also very much the Israeli uh, approach, not to make too much of a song and dance about it. But I, I think it just symbolically shows a problem within the, the very structure of the Christchurch call. Why would this lively democracy not be allowed to be part of this organisation? And doubly so, as you pointed out, uh, with anti-Semitism as the canary in the coal mine of all and pretty much every act of intolerance. Um, so no, it, it's it just shows that the call is is broken from the outset. Yeah, that's a that'd be a saving that we could uh, we could get immediately just axing that. It's just not needed. I mean, we've well, even no. seen surveys being conducted by so called disinformation experts that are saying now that they were surprised at how little disinformation there is actually around. Um, these these are the so called experts, and they were shocked that their their uh, survey, their their study of disinformation showed that it was a very very tiny amount of disinformation and misinformation that was being spread that was then changing people's views or whatever. It was a, almost under one percent or something like that. It was ridiculously small. So I don't think we yeah. even need it. Oh look, I I. I don't mind civil organisations wanting to discuss these these topics. I'm always very nervous when governments get involved and we always remember the single source of truth mm -hmm. statement. And for me, it's slightly symbolic of obviously that situation, but the wider ones. You just don't want need government bodies in any shape or form trying to determine what is right think or right speak uh, and what they deem as disinformation versus not. It's, it's a very, very fraught, very, very fraught area. And so, you know, the fact that the Christchurch calls mandate has has widened almost from day one from obviously the tragedy uh, mm. with the mosque shootings into now a whole array again of progressive course, uh, causes is, is uh, something that should be ringing alarm bells in people's minds. You end up with a situation like the Human Rights Commission where, who, were, who are uh, decidedly absent on actual human rights. Uh, we saw during the pandemic the, the utter silence at some of the most appalling breaches of uh, our Bill of Rights um, that occurred. You know, people um, were being forced and mandated uh, to have medical procedures completely against the Bill of Rights. Uh, we had our, our freedoms uh, trampled on. Uh, we had healthy people locked up in their homes. We had citizens of New Zealand unable to even come into the country. And uh, because you were in Parliament at this time, and which manifested itself in you know a very large protest for a very long period of time, and there hasn't been a protest like that actually in New Zealand, except for maybe perhaps Bastion Point or or Motua Gardens, you know, in terms of an occupation of an area for a lengthy amount of time. And no, I agree. Yeah, you know, we we saw. We saw the end result of that, which was the power of the state trampling over people's right to protest. But at the same time, we also saw the media in lockstep with uh, what the government said, uh, standing there up there on the balcony at Parliament, uh, you know, protected uh, by you know, armies of police and, uh, and cheering on the government. And we also saw the bizarre situation, and, and, and I'm interested in your insights on this, where every political party that was in the parliament at the time agreed that they wouldn't go and actually meet or talk to the protesters. 
did that, you're a free speech person. Did that really great with you? I mean, no, I'm not sure anybody's ever asked you that, but I'm going to. Yeah, no, it's a good question. No, it did great. I think, you know, I, I can't speak for all MPs by any means, but I think, you know, it was a real conundrum, a real question for a lot of people. Our natural inclination, certainly mine, is to go and talk to people. And certainly in the early days of the, the protests, so for me personally, the protest dynamic did begin to change, mm. um, which doesn't invalidate it, but there was a, a change. But actually, our job is to, to listen to people. Uh, and there was many a time as I was out and about on the, the street, so this is down in Wellington, that would bump into my constituents going, well, where mm. are you? And you go, well, it's tricky, I'm here right now. But in terms of engaging yeah. in the protest. So, yeah, I think, unfortunately, that group thing that we've been touching on across a number of topics sort of kicked in and the early decisions, partly, and to be fair, on the, the leadership uh, at the time, um, across the, the parties and the parliament, there was sort of an uncertainty of what was happening, the advice they were getting, the decision was made, look, let's not engage. And then once they'd made that decision, it comes back to what we are talking around unity earlier, it's very hard to change course. And the longer mm. that went on, then it becomes a real high-risk situation for any MP or MPs to go against that. In other words, had an MP gone out, um, well, they would have been able to go out, no one's going to crash tackle them, but politically I think they would have been eviscerated from their parties, leadership, media and otherwise and become effectively impotent for the rest of their career. So a lot of MPs, myself included, were making those calculations. But fundamentally, I think so much would have changed had people talked and listened. Um, as in politicians, I mean, that's what we're there to to do. Yeah. You represent not you're just the, the good. Exactly right. It's, you're there to, to take all sorts of conversations from all sorts of of people. And it's my personal view that I think the, the two things that I might can, one, the where the protest ended would have been different. But secondly, I think we wouldn't have the same level of resentment we have today in New Zealand. And that's not just around the way the parliament handled the protest, but the way COVID was managed, I think has left deep, well, not think, I know, has left scars. deep scars and hurt and resentment. Uh, and a lot of people want to uh, paper over that, particularly those who were lockstep with Jacinda. Um, but as I go about friends, family, acquaintances, and just people I know, there's, there's deep, deep hurt. And it's going to take a while to heal. And one of the things is it's got this, what happened has to be discussed very openly and frankly, and you don't see any desire for that uh, no. within certain segments of society, sadly. No, there is no desire for that. And, you know, I, I knew um, various leaders of particular groups. And I was speaking to them during that protest. Um, they just wanted to be heard. And, and if if Trevor Mallard and Cinder Ardern and Chris Hipkins had got together with, you know, um, Christopher Luxon uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, David Seymour and erected a tent out there on the front front of the forecourt with some chairs around it in front of everybody and actually sat down for an afternoon and talked uh, very early on, that protest would have dissipated. They, people would have felt that they were listened to. People would have felt they were heard and you wouldn't have had the lengthy protest that you had. But the intransigence of first of all the regime and then all the other political parties led to, as you say, some deep scars and some hurts that, hey, the people we elect don't want to listen to us. Well, if they don't want to listen to us, then we need to get rid of them. <laughs> and that's where you get the the, the mischief uh, starting to, to, to come in when actually people just, people just, they were hurting. They'd lost jobs, careers, things they'd devoted their life, and in, in particularly if they're nurses or police or military, they don't do it for the money. They do it for uh, a, a desire to help and serve, and they were treated appallingly for making a choice that is actually protected in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, well, I think, you know, at the higher level, um, that well, I've often said, you know, our rights exist for the bad times. Uh, and I raised that in Parliament several times as well. I remember. Um, because, yeah, human rights, we don't need them when times are good. They're there for the bad times. And, you know, if you looked at New Zealand's scorecard around the management of COVID, we, we failed, be it freedom of speech, association, um, you know, the privacy around your health care, freedom of religion, and so forth. I mean, I don't think there was any that we uh, would have got a pass on. And we broke and them all. <laughs> we did, yeah, pretty much collect the whole set. Um, 
So that's uh, exceptionally sad. I think it's also why we've seen, and it, it's not just the issues of COVID. I'd say over the years, as again, people are being railroaded into a particular way of thinking or acting. I think it's causing that resentment, frustration, and anger uh, in New Zealanders. And it's why you are seeing more, if you will, partisan politics, why you're seeing more frustrations, and why there's in some ways less debate and discussion and more outbursts of frustration. Mm. Um, and it's only going to get worse because the more people try to lock things down, so hate speech laws, uh, limiting inquiries, telling people you can only have this opinion, um, it's going to be like squeezing a balloon. It's going to manifest or pop out in, in other spaces and often not in a very constructive way. Mm. I, mean, I agree with you on that. If you tell, if you tell someone like me, uh, you can't say that. I say, well, who the hell are you to tell me what I can, can and can't say? And then I say it anyway. Uh, yeah. You know, and and that's exactly why Reality Check Radio was born and exists because of that frustration that there were no media outlets out there that would allow people to have free and frank discussions without wanting to cut each other's throats. I mean, you and I probably agree on probably maybe 65, 70% of something, the 30%, they're not life and death situations, you know, that we're going to cease to talk to each other um, because we disagree with with us on, I don't know, it could be something as anodyne as cannabis use, you know. You might <laughs> yeah. you might say no and I might say, well, you know, mellow out, bro. You oh, know? That's right, chill out. But those, that's the most fascinating area. I mean, you know it, and your listeners know it. When you sit down with friends, colleagues, whoever, the 60 or 70% of whatever you agree on is interesting to talk about. But actually yeah. it's that 40 or 30% that you don't. Yeah. Um, and as adults in, a, in a, a properly functioning democracy, you can actually sit about uh, and chat and debate and learn and sometimes change, or you learn a bit more about why you believe what you do. But we, we do seem to be, as a society, stomping that out and again it, it doesn't the, the topics where you're only allowed to have one view seems to be increasing and i suppose again it's sort of a bit of a theme of where we're going today that it, it, it's not going to end in a good place because people just get frustrated and frustration always looks for a way to manifest itself and sometimes constructively so that there's no more media like reality check and others is a good thing actually um, I see it as actually a healthy sign to our democracy yeah. that people, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. And that's what we're trying to do here at RCR is get all types on the radio. Let's talk to them without interrupting them or trying to push our point of view across in, in a hostile, um, competitive Dog eat dog style ten minute interview. That's why we talk to people for thirty minutes or forty minutes mm. or even an hour or, or so. Because a we can because we haven't got you know broadcasting schedules like like other places have. Mm. Uh, and b it's far more fascinating to understand what makes people tick. You know where they've come from. I mean, you know we kind of share a little bit of a, a Fijian heritage, which most people don't know about, right? You served as, right. as a missionary in Fiji. I was born in Fiji, you know. So, um, uh, it's the things that those are the things that don't come out in the normal combative political type discussions, but they're the kinds of things that come out when we sit here and un try and understand where each person is coming from. Okay, absolutely. And you know, I referenced earlier how you know Parliament doesn't have as much time to reflect on issues and actually an element of that too is a lot of times MPs don't get a chance to interact deeply with with one another so there will be elements and I'm as much within this or was you know there were MPs in that parliament or the parliaments I was involved with I have no idea on mm. their background I mean I know that they're green or labor but I'd have no idea about their life story and all them about mine and in a strange way that's a bit sad because actually when you get to know people you understand a little bit more about how they tick, how they think, and ultimately you can have a, I think, a more fulsome, a fulsome discussion. But the other thing, and that you look, I think you touched on it with mainstream media. They do, to be fair, operate under enormous amount of, of pressures, be it financial or, mm. or time schedules. But you do see they they very quickly pick and choose uh, MPs they like and MPs they don't like. And the same with commentators. They'll mm. always go back to certain commentators. 
uh, not others. And I think that's unfortunate because, you know, I look across the parliaments I was involved with, there were really good MPs in Labour or Greens, National, uh, wherever, that basically got no airtime at all. And it was really sad, I think, because they have a lot to contribute. And the same in this parliament. You'll be certain MPs, you know, Chloe Sraubach will be on the front page of the, the Herald most weeks. But I tell you, there's there's piles of people within, say, the National Party and Labour who also deserve to be heard with their views, but but they won't, sadly. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to see this myself, you know, nearly six years ago now when I, when I had a stroke and I was in hospital, you know, and um, it was astonishing the politicians that I've interacted with over the years who were completely silent about it and those who came and visited me or or inquired. Now, I can tell you that there was just one national MP that bothered, right? And so I'll die in a ditch for that MP because they showed compassion when I was hurting. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also a number of Labour MPs that contacted me, and one in particular sent me uh, a lovely set of text messages just out of the blue. And I thought... You know, you didn't have to do that, but you saw someone hurting and you reached out, and I'll never attack that person either. You know, I'll never I'll, – I'll, I'll have a more kindly view on any foibles that they may have or any issues that – now, I don't think they're ever going to set the world on fire, right, as an MP, but I have a huge amount of respect for them that they defied their party directives not to speak to Cameron Slater and actually reached out to a human being. And well, I, uh, and that's yeah. the thing that I get to see uh, a lot of uh, in my interactions with MPs and politicians and you know people like yourself, and which is what I try and get out of talking to those people, so I I can share that same you know interaction that I had I've had with those people, so they can understand why I think like I do about particular politicians. Which all makes it all makes sense. I mean, I was struck when I uh, finished up in Parliament and lost last year. Um, so not as dramatic, of course, of, of having a medical uh, stroke, but the number of MPs from the other side who actually yeah. messaged me took took me aback. I mean, it was absolutely lovely. Um, yeah. But I was quite taken aback. I mean, I personally, and you know, they'd have to speak themselves. I, I've tried not to be a jackass uh, <laughs> to the. To the other side, I, I, I've tried not to. I probably failed at different points, but always tried to keep up good relationships. But I was quite touched, actually, mm. um, the messages that came through. The second point, if I could, is actually I, I think being a good MP shouldn't be judged simply on the ranking they get to or the or office tweet. that they hold. Or a tweet. No, I think there is there are so many good MPs that I've met over time that you know will never be ministers. Yep. Um, but actually, they are hardworking. They represent their community. And that's what it's actually about. The parliament's there to represent. So actually, yeah, the quieter MP who doesn't make a huge noise that, yep, isn't an undersecretary or a minister, isn't any less effective. In fact, often they're very effective and they're doing their job well. And maybe you know, I could add this, often with very little uh, praise. Um, and we all like to be told we're doing a great job, but actually they just carry on doing their job for their constituents or whatever group they represent. And I think that's to be, that's really to be admired. And it's something we're potentially losing. Uh, we, you talked about the, mm. uh, I'm going to talk about the celebrity culture yeah, that we yeah. seem to be pushing, putting on to leadership. And that's certainly a, 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 an issue here, but it's also happening to MPs in general. It's sort of the ones that get again the coverage and then all these others, oh, what do they do? Actually, they're doing their job. Yeah. They're doing it really well. They're being considered, and then select committees are asking sensible questions because they've done their reading. They're they're not out glory seeking. Um, you know, my my old grandfather uh, used to say when us kids were hearing around his place, he'd he'd sit down and go, "Empty vessels make the most noise." You know, we were little kids. We go, "What, what, Grandpa? What, what does that mean? Empty vessels make the most. Think about it. Empty vessels make the most noise." And then when I became a salesman, uh, you know, my one of my mentors said to me, he says, Cam, you've got two ears and one mouth, and that's the ratio that you use them in. And that's the same advice I give to politicians when they come to me for advice. You know, 
uh, you know, what advice can you give me? Two ears, one mouth, use them in that ratio. Um, yeah. And th th that's the thing that I see with Christopher Luxon. He's, he's very quick to start talking and keep talking um, when actually silence or, or a more considered answer would be a better result. Um, yeah, that's trainable. You can train your way out of that. But you've got a willing, you've got to have a willingness to actually sit down and listen. And and you know, you've alluded to it, I've alluded to it. Politicians seem to have lost the ability to listen and consider. And listening doesn't mean you agree. The listening just means you listen. It's like why it's why I like having a wine with Chris Trotter, for example, right? Because I want to hear what he's got to say. I might not agree with it, but he might influence me and I might influence him. And so that's why we have that discourse and and polarization and segmentation and all of those things prevent discourse. And and we need to get back to that. That, you know, strongly uh, need to get back to that uh, to avoid calamity. Because New Zealand's yeah, we, about five years, New Zealand's about five years behind the rest of the world, right? All this DEI stuff um, has happened in the UK and in the US turned into a disaster. The trans uh, trans rights uh, movement has turned into a disaster, but we're still pushing ahead with it because the rest of the world's done and the rest of the world's come to a grinding halt and gone, whoa, hang on a second here, you know, particularly with women in sport. Yeah, well, unfortunately, New Zealand sort of falls into this exceptionalism mindset at, at times, and what I mean by that is we, we think we're different. <clears throat> um well, we're not. I mean, we're an amazing country. Let's take all of that as red. But actually, a, a lot of things which happen in the rest of the world do happen here as well. And it would be great if New Zealand at times would look overseas and go, hey, if we continue down the path we're headed, we're going to do exactly what's happened in the UK or Australia or the States or wherever. So we need to, at times, I think, step away from that exceptionalism. Mm. Um, I think the second, um, yeah, more discourse, it's why as you know, a great believer in, in free speech. You know, I have no problem with people having very different views to mine. In fact, you know, it was a little known fact, but, you know, when we had these, I went through major ethical um, discussions when I was in Parliament, didn't go in for them, but they seemed to follow me. So abortion, euthanasia, there was conversion therapy, uh, cannabis use. I mean, they're all there. But mm. I would spend most of my time actually listening to the alternative side Mm. So, you know, in my electorate office, people who wanted to come and tell me that they agreed with me wouldn't get an interview or wouldn't get a slot because I don't need to be told that. Yeah. Time was made for opponents or people who shared it, uh, sorry, who had a different view. That was much more use uh, to me. Uh, and so we need more of that. But to be fair, Cam, on the MPs themselves, I think they do want to listen. We, if I could, even though I was a former MP, we do want to listen. It's just that the job has become so intense, so full on, you are chasing your tail. So that's that's a reason, not an excuse, but um, it's just so busy that those deep conversations don't happen. And I'm sure many people who turned up to select committee, you know, they get their little five minutes to discuss a major issue and then we're on to the next and the next and the next. Um, so it's yeah. the system even isn't working as the, well as it could. Even, they had, even though they had their five minutes, they often go away feeling they weren't heard. You know, oh, exactly, exactly. Um, which is sad. And look, having sat on those select committees at times, um, you try to listen, picky when you're doing like all day hearings. Do you imagine literally starting from eight in the morning till six at night, five minute after five minute? I mean, eventually it's just all swirling. But I have no doubt that people would have sat with me across the table doing my best to listen, but at times I would have zoned out and they would have picked up on that. And that's unfortunate, but that's the probably the structural problems we have in the system. But on the flip side, if I might, I won't mention uh, the, the MPs or the particular uh, bills or discussions, but, you know, there were times both in government and opposition where, in particular, my Labour colleagues would say something really profound. They would have seen something, and it happened on the, you know, my national colleagues as well, mm. but I do remember a couple of times where you're debating a topic in private insight committee and they had a really profound insight, and it makes everyone stop. So there's there's still great dynamics that happen, but MPs are just overwhelmed, and it's yeah. um, maybe that's a discussion for another day of how we fix that. Yeah, I mean, just on the select committee thing, often you see contentious bills before the House, and you look at the, mm -hmm. the submissions, and there'll be thousands of submissions 
against the proposals of the bill. And very few in support of the bill, yet somehow the select committee comes to the conclusion that um, this is what the people want, um, and so we're going to press on regardless. And, and a classic example of that is the firearms legislation. Mm. You know, the people who were most affected by that were effectively ignored. There was thousands of, of submissions against it. There was plenty of submissions that proposed a better way to do things. Uh, the government pressed on with their draconian uh, laws uh, around that that haven't been effective. We've seen a proliferation of gun crime because the only people who were affected by the gun laws were law-abiding citizens and criminals aren't law-abiding, so they weren't affected. Uh, so we had a proliferation of gun crime. Uh, we've got uh, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent to put in place a register, which has never worked anywhere in the world. Uh, Canada tried it and spent nearly a billion dollars uh, before mm -hmm. they decided to destroy it. The Australian one doesn't work at all. Um, the, we're already seeing now with the register in place uh, just um, astonishing anomalies because uh, of a, uh, uh, a a lack of experience in, in the in the register, the people who are in the register, and we're seeing guns that are being registered with model numbers as serial numbers and all sorts of nonsense like that. I mean, you know, I can remember at Antique Arms, getting Mike McElrath to come along and speak to the 200 members of Antique Arms. And somebody said, well, what if a firearm doesn't have a serial number? And he said, well, that it must do. Well, well, sorry, Mike, but serial numbers didn't come in uh, into force until about 1899 with industrialization. Almost all guns before that were handmade. Uh, mm -hmm. In the ones that weren't handmade, you know, like say Martini Henry's or something like that, there was no need for serialization, so they didn't do it. And he said, "Well, well, all you need to do then is put the the largest number uh, that's on, that's on the on the gun and use that." And we all laughed. We just all laughed at him because, like, I've got ten Martini Henry's, right, of various different models. I collect them, and the largest number on the side of all of those is the date of manufacture. So I might have five Martini Henry rifles with 1887 on them. Mm. And they're in the register as a Martini Henry of this caliber with this serial number with 1887. And if I've got five, there's another 200 out there that have got 1887 on the side of them as well. But that's the ludicrous nature of this tunnel vision thinking that occurs with the formation of legislation for ideological purposes. Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, someone who loves history, the Martini Henry is a very famous ex-infantry weapon for the, the British, mm. of course, very famous in the movie Zulu, amongst yes. other things. Um, but no, it, you're right. I mean, it, it's a good example of how governments of the day, and again, it goes across the political spectrum, make a policy decision, and they just push on through. Um, sometimes a select committee, or rather the submissions into a select committee and the select committee itself uh, can change the trajectory of a of a law, but you know it's very very rare. And a lot of that, for your listeners to understand, comes back to what we discussed at the start, which is the notion of unity. So you know, if Minister X puts forward an idea or a policy, the select committee, which you know by and large is dominated by the governing power, mm. um, um, if the select committee puts out a contrary opinion, that's sort of seen as scandalous, and all of a sudden. The government of the day is caught up in a media firestorm about why the minister said this, but the select committee did that. Um, and so it doesn't tend to happen as much as it probably should. Um, and it's unfortunate because by and large what you see, and it's a deeper problem in our democracy, that – so I'm not hesitating for any other reason trying to – how to articulate it quickly and simply, that basically a government decides its policy, very little changes. It's it just concrete. goes it's, through the system. There's a psychological uh, term for it called concrete thinking. Uh, once, they, once they've made a decision on something, they press on full steam ahead. We're not willing to entertain any changes whatsoever, even though the actual subject experts are saying, if you do this, it's going to do that. It's going to cause this problem. And we're seeing that now, particularly on firearms law, particularly on, on some other aspects of law. Euthanasia is another one uh, where... People were warned what the unintended consequences of this legislation was going to be, but they did it anyway. And now you're yeah. starting to see those consequences 
start to raise their head and everyone going, you know, well, why didn't they see that? Well, they were told, you know. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how we fix that. Um, there's this rapid fire legislative, you know, vigor that they want to pass as many laws as they can when actually we should be saying, well, no, for every law we pass, let's try and get rid of two others <laughs> and actually have less laws. Wouldn't it be better if we had less laws? I think so. I mean, um, all the grammarians at the moment are screaming, by the way, Cam, they'll be going, fewer laws, fewer laws. <laughs> Probably, I don't care. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I they they might be I saying that, but I, but, but I bet you they didn't get 95% in their school exams for English because I did. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I always have to be careful when I do my writing. I will always get one or two people message through and point out all my grammatical mistakes. If yeah, that's look, all I they've think, got to complain about, <laughs> then, the, then there's I really not take, much wrong in the world, is there? <laughs> that's right. I Look, I, I think we are over-legislated in New Zealand. It is one of the reasons why MPs are, are incredibly stretched. You know, it, it's easy to say, but it's quite true that MPs, are, are overworked and um, the amount of legislation going through is, is part of it. And it's hard to consider all of it, exactly how you change it. That's going to be really, really difficult. I mean, part of it is, I think, looking at the way we structure the electoral system. But again, that's that's a whole big topic for another day. That's a whole but, you know, other topic. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does need to change because otherwise we're just going to have, as I mentioned about halfway through this, we just have amendment bill after amendment bill, and we should always remember that an amendment bill is there because something has gone wrong. Yeah, by and large, something wasn't done right the first something time. Wasn't thought through properly. Exactly right. And look, there's always going to be situations where it doesn't matter who submits or what MPs think we we miss things. But it's just happening more and more frequently. And again, a big part of it comes down government of the day, be it red or blue, decides this is the trajectory. And it's very difficult to shift that. And media plays its own part because, again, it attacks aggressively if there's any change where we should allow fault. Governments shouldn't be absolutely pilloried for going, you know what, we thought about this a bit more and we decided we didn't have it quite right. Yeah. Almost impossible for a minister to admit any I fault. Can't, I can't remember a single case where a bill has gone through the select committee and the select committee has said, yeah, now we don't need to do this. I cannot remember a single case. Okay, on individual members' bills, that may be the case. But when a government is putting up a bill, it invariably goes through uh, all of the stages and as smooth a way as possible, depending on how important that bill is to the government. Look, absolutely. There are, though, a couple of, and I won't remember the specifics, but I'm pretty sure on the last parliament, one committee didn't actually write um, a report. So the select committee just returned the bill as it was to the government with no commentary. So that was quite a, mm. a bold uh, statement. And again, I apologise to you and your listeners. There was another example, I think it might have been in foreign affairs, where they did push back quite hard. I think it was on the mass arrivals bill, actually, that uh, Michael Woods was pushing through, that both Labour and National MPs United and usually to say this is just not not good at all. But again, it just keeps being pushed on through. And the sad thing, Cam, for me is that the focus often through media becomes on the supposed scandal, not the substance of why. In other words, the focus was not saying, well, why are the MPs pushing back? The story was, oh, the MPs are pushing against their minister. Is this showing um, disillusionment? It's like, no, that's the mm. sideshow. What's the substance? What's the real, you know, why are yeah, the yeah, MPs yeah. concerned? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're pushing up against time now, Simon, and you know it's been a real pleasure having this chat with you. What many listeners don't don't understand is that my sister actually tried to challenge you. In the she event, did. I wasn't right? going to mention it. <laughs> oh, I'm ha I'm happy to mention what I'm trying. Why I'm mentioning it is, you've got every reason to not talk to me, you know, because of my something my sister did. But yet we're here. We are having a discussion for almost an hour. Um, which has been convivial and pleasant and, and, and an exercise in learning for the both of us. And that that's just to show them, the listeners, that we actually can, even though we may have uh, differences of opinions, um, you know, familial connections or, fa you know, all those sorts of things, that we can actually sit down and talk with each other. And that's the important thing. And I guess that's the thrust of the whole discussion that you and I have had today is the need to continue to discuss things. 
it's the absolute critical part of it, actually. I mean, as humans, we can find a myriad of reasons to be disgruntled and want to silence people. Uh, we need to pretty much ignore those, actually, and make sure we sit down. And I would always make the argument, you, you sit down more with the people you disagree with. I want to be clear, that's not the basis of our discussion today. It's just it's been quite convivial. But, you know, when we get pushed on issues that are really deeply important to us, that's the real time to sit down and have more uh, conversation. So, no, Cam, thanks for the chance to chat. Regards to your sister as well. Yeah, I'll pass those on. And, uh, you know, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, I think our listeners uh, are going to learn a thing or two about Simon O'Connor, and that's uh, a great thing. Thanks so much. So now we know. You see, when politicians cease being politicians, you get the unvarnished truth. The MPs were muzzled by the leaders of the parties during the protest and told not to go and speak to the protesters. It's good to know. I found this interview, however, absolutely fascinating, and I think Parliament is poorer for not having Simon O'Connor in the House. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.